Hello everyone, welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's Weekend Frivolity. Uh, this is our brother chicken show. Uh, microphone's on the desk in front of me. Actually, uh, it is pretty darn chilly here up in the Pacific Northwest today. Lots of ice out there. So, I've got the full-on space eater going here. Freezing my nades off, but what the hell. I got the crypto OG look going good. Got my uniform. I think I've worn this uniform literally every single day for the past uh, six months. <laughs> I don't go out and socialize anymore, so uh, I find it hilarious that uh, if you go outside now and uh, they, I thought it was so funny. I saw Jay Leno doing a show about cars. And he's driving in the car with one other person. And by California law, they had to be wearing masks. <laughs> it's just like, wow, what a world we live in. So uh, sadly, I think I'm just sort of going to hang out in my hovel and just uh, uh, turtle until uh, this all passes. And then maybe we'll go out like out of our caves and go like sort of after the nuclear war is over looking out. Hey, I remember this world. Oh, well, crazy world. Uh, speaking of nuclear winter, geez, it feels like we had a nuclear bomb that was dropped there in the risk market last week, eh? And I guess this makes sense because uh, I think you could make the argument that most of uh, what you see in the market these days, price appreciation, was just nothing more than free money, the hot money being thrown at the market by uh, the central planners um, and it just bidding uh, prices of stuff up. Uh, the only problem with that is uh, good old uh, Newton's law of gravity. <laughs> I think that's just one of his laws. Uh, the only way stuff is going to stay up is they just have to keep throwing more and more bags of money at the market. This isn't, it's not natural demand. Uh, it's not fundamental valuation, i.e. companies are growing earnings streams dramatically and new huge business uh, veins are opening up and uh, massive new contracts are being signed and, you know, stuff's getting done. It's not that. Uh, this is nothing more than the uh, the central planners, the academics, saying, hey, we can solve the problem. Just go print a whole shitload of money. Throw bags of money. And the problem here is we get this hyperinflation scenario because these idiots went and threw bags of money at the market, but there was no way for the market to handle the supply problems, right? We got these supply chain uh, bottlenecks. So it wasn't like there was going to be any more supply that was going to be added to the equation. Throw bags of money at the market, limited supply, you do the math. I mean, this is economics 101. What a surprise. Prices exploded higher. <sighs> so frustrating. And, you know, the problem with that is that we all have to understand that this is exactly the plan of the banks. This is exactly what they want to have happen. In fact, they have to have this happen. <laughs> so... You look at it and you go, well, you know, so anybody with half a brain, when you massively increase, uh, you know, the money supply and you have limited supplies of goods and, you know, a whole bunch of really stressed out humans that are not really doing anything, just sitting there picking their noses, you're going to get massive competition and price spikes in, uh, in demand for the limited products. I mean, that's just, like I said, that's just Econ 101. So sad. So what I've seen since the Jupiter Saturn cross, by the way, which I think this is the whole damn the whole thing is predicated on this. Uh, J.P. Morgan, right? Millionaires don't respect astrology; billionaires do. Um. Now that we're on the other side of the Jupiter Saturn cross, I mean the irony of it all is that really we got to be thinking like 30, 40 years of rising interest rates. 30, 40 years of less accommodation, 30, 40 years of bankers being typical bankers, and they'll just they'll foreclose on you if you don't play ball. So uh, I've, I've suggested strongly to people take the advantage, take the time now. 
uh, wow, the sort of the market is relatively uh, calm and relatively friendly. Pay down all your debt now, while uh, while interest rates are really low. And uh, and you know if you can do things like lock in long term mortgages, uh, you know, and and lock in these really really low rates, that's not a bad idea because the value of money, of course, is going to be falling appreciably over time. Uh, the only issue that I see in my country is actually a really good example is it's tough to get like a 20, 30 year mortgage right now. It's, it's not easy and the rates aren't going to be nice and low and cheap like you think. It's only these variable short term uh, mortgage rates that really dip down really low and I think that that's actually a trap. Everybody, of course, gets sucked into borrowing at the short end. They're constantly sort of, you know, under the gun. And then like what they did in the States is they can crank up the uh, lending requirements, not even have to change the rates, just the sort of the quality of the borrower. And if you don't meet a certain grade, then all of a sudden, mysteriously, your rates go cranking up. And, and the damn yield curve didn't even change. So... Uh, I, I feel like there's huge traps being laid, so be careful, everyone. And like I said, you know, there's an old adage, neither a debtor nor a lender be. I love the idea of just making sure you have no debt whatsoever. You're not sort of a, a, a victim of the system. Um, and, uh, you know, diversify, diversify, diversify. So... Uh, that includes crypto, folks. I mean, cryptos, uh, you know, the, the message that I try to convey to people, which uh, is a bit frustrating because I don't think a lot of people really uh, like the message, for one thing. But I also don't think that they believe me. But um, I believe Colonel Mustard did it in drawing with Kinsta. No, 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 you wish shut up. Uh, I believe that the stock market... The um, the sort of energy component uh, of the risk market, um, or I guess the energy component of the commodities market, beg your pardon, as a function of sort of growth. Uh, and ironically enough, uh, cryptocurrencies as another proxy within that space, actually they're all technically sort of risk assets. There is the big debate about things like gold versus Bitcoin. I might argue that, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollar you know, well, I guess fifty <laughs> what, uh, forty, fifty thousand dollar Bitcoin right now. <laughs> um is it trading anywhere near value? And you know, does it have maybe like that growth sort of premium built into it? I kinda think so. So uh, as a result, you know, they take the punch bowl away from stocks, from, you know, physical hard assets like the oil market, which is interesting because in a weird sort of way, um, and I don't even know whether the, the bankers were expecting this, but the, the oil sort of supply people... They really cut the supply. Speaking of sort of, you know, supply bottlenecks and what happens when you remove supply from this kind of situation. Uh, you know, prices of oil went spiking higher. And I don't even think OPEC and those people even thought that that was going to even a possibility. They're always so obsessed with the falling oil price. <laughs> so... I think I heard recently that OPEC kind of went, whoa, gee whiz, I guess we don't have to be so religious and, you know, starts <laughs> you know, supplying more oil and all of a sudden, mysteriously, uh, price starts to come off. One image that really startled me, which I thought was really cool, but an excellent analogy of this sort of, you know, where does risk on risk off fall and, you know, oil, energy, maybe oil is not the best word, but like energy is probably a better word. Uh, and something like cryptocurrencies, um, uh, we follow the uh, futures markets, of course, at TRI, and there's the crude oil market. And I was kind of barking about big outside downside reversals a week or two ago and, uh, you know, M tops. I mean, this is everything that we teach in reload zones, blah, blah, blah. So really, it doesn't surprise me that this is happening, but this is kind of cool how you look at that crude oil market as the energy proxy. Then you come over to uh, something like um, this over here. 
the Bitcoin market, and lo and behold, um, yeah, where's the best place to look at this? I guess over. Well, I guess we'll look it over here. Actually, there was something I actually did buy through this dump. I actually bought some of this stuff. Ah, go figure. Um, when you look at this Bitcoin chart, this is going to be a bit messy. Ready? Come on. Actually, that one's not so bad. But, uh, man, the, the images are startling similar. Startlingly similar. In fact, uh, and I really, you know, this is this was a really, really good lesson that we had just recently about the importance of the trend lines. And I really tried to drive home to you guys watching this. You know, like uh, that um, great Dal Moody guy that's writing notes and really taking what I say here seriously. Um, you know, there is a really, really good analogy of that trend line um, rule that I have. Of course, everybody in the school program. It's actually really cool. The level oneers. I sat in and listened to the level oneers. Uh, Kiran, our uh, our consummate professional uh, futures trader. Uh, he and Daniele have um, um, they have a program. Actually, we're going to try and figure out how we sort of uh, get you guys sort of to move on to that. I suppose if you really do want to. Uh, be day traders. They have a whole website and everything all set up. But anyway, we'll get to that down the road. Um, but uh, listening to uh, Kiran come in and talk to the level twoers about all the fun candy that they can, or uh, Kiran come in and talking to the level oneers that, that are potentially moving on to the level two program, all the candy that they're going to learn. And this is, you know, in our school program, that's specifically where you learn those rules but wow what a great story and actually this is kind of cool because what i like to do is i actually believe that there's like um you know like with the matrix with the code sort of cascading down the walls and all that kind of stuff i actually think that that this is really more orchestrated than you think and actually more organized and ironically enough i think the uh, the market actually looks something along these lines so again that sort of thinking of how you use trend lines i actually think there's a really polite trend channel that's at work here and it's interesting how we dump down into the bottom of this channel and price actually quickly jackknifed away from there and then what i thought was really interesting about price action recently is i've told you guys and i probably sound like a broken record and probably a little bit uh crazy but gee whiz this gosh darn high to low trend line I mean, I've been saying over the past six months that I thought this was really the magnet of the market. And when we got zipping up top there and we started putting in divergences and then we started actually putting in an M up here, I was just like, oh boy. And of course, big fat round number, 50,000 bucks. So <laughs> what a surprise. Here we are. We made it. <laughs> so fascinating how these silly things play out. One thing that really jumped out at me, and this has been freaking me out, is um, I don't know whether you guys uh, ever hear me going on about uh, billiard ball theory. But they say that randomness actually doesn't look very random. It actually has a very uh, sort of, um, oops, I kind of screwed that up, darn. It actually has a very predictable uh, pattern to it. Anyway, something along, I thought it was interesting, especially up in here, when I saw this happen, this to me, that looked like my billiard ball uh, theory thinking. And I found it fascinating that this is Mr. Gann's uh, one year anniversary date. This was actually when the, and this was the spot, this is a 50% retracement of, um, of this entire move. I can't remember how it went. Um, I guess it was uh, one year uh, to 50%, something along those lines. I can't remember exactly what I did here. But anyway, the point that I just make is I had marked that as an important date on my calendar and I found it fascinating because I was thinking that the market was going to work its way down into this day but what it almost looks like to me which is really freaky and I know it's awfully hard to see this this just looks like an absolute mess 
But uh, just keep this uh, mark right in mind here, right? Just like right about exactly the middle of the screen. So that was like right here. Isn't it kind of weird how it almost looks like this was like pivoting up and then back? <laughs> That's terrible. But it was like pivoting up uh, and, and making almost the exact opposite of that. You know, that sort of billiard ball kind of thing that I'm thinking. That this is some sort of vortex event here. And it's interesting how that looks like it's almost a perfect fractal off right off that event. So there is something more to Mr. Gann's date here, I think, than, uh, than uh, what's playing out here. And I find it fascinating because I was thinking, well, shouldn't we be down in this area here? But it almost looks like that's now become the midpoint of this fulcrum. Fulcrum? I don't know whether midpoint's the right word. Fulcrum is midpoint, something like that. Anyway. So, uh, musing from the trenches, something jumped out at me a well that I thought was fascinating was, uh, you see, of course, this fog and bomb level um, was basically sort of stopped our bull. That was the fog and bomb 4.669 off of this W down here, which I think makes sense to me. Um, and, oh, by the way, A, B, C, D, there was the A, B, C, D level. And it was fascinating when I put this message out here that, oh, it looks like we've run into some resistance. Maybe this is the top. I got, like, you know, publicly rebuked on, on social media and Twitter and stuff. No, you are wrong, that kind of thing. And it's just fascinating to look how over time it looks like that was some sort of crazy-ass sort of resistance level up there. I really think so. Um, now, you know, in the short term, I thought this was kind of cool. Um, if we do the fog and bombs going the other direction off of this M here, the top, and notice that this is that A, B, C, D level, that is fog and bomb on the way up. So I think this is some sort of pivot point up here. Notice how 2.618 was this traffic in he area in here. So I think that was legit. And then notice, where did we stop the dump here? Hello, right up Mr. Foggenbaum. So, you know, obviously this was such a dramatic event that it went quite a bit beyond, but fascinating how there's that funny little trend line. I was talking about the high to low trend line. How significant is that going forward? And there's Mr. Foggenbaum. Staring us right inside a reload zone. <laughs> it's almost funny how cliche this stuff is. <laughs> Just over and over and over. Um, I suppose one could argue, you know, we have uh, multiple ranges here. So you could argue that uh, this bigger range, right, that dump was nothing more than into a mountain man level. That's off of this entire range here. I kind of like that thinking, too. I'd also say, too, and I don't know whether you guys have heard me say this before, but you can see I've got these, you know, uh, tails need to be eaten, you know, especially when we're ripping up here and you're like, oh, is this market risky? And you look back and you go, well, that tail needs to be eaten. These tails need to be eaten. This tail needs to be eaten. This tail needs to be eaten. And that, my friends, is the process of all those tails being eaten. Nom, 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 done. Notice, where did we stop here? Well, you know, have you heard me say, look left? So you can see that this was all wide open here. All we had are all these tails. And sure enough, where was last key support? Well, it was right down here. So where are we going to stop? Doink, right into that level. And it's uh, it's only, it's funny when you look at this stuff after a while, you kind of go, oh my goodness, is this really this cliche? But uh, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, it's quite remarkable. Um, I think, uh, you know, and, and, and I, uh, I've been, I've had a lot of fun of working with this patchwork, uh, recently. And I think on balance, we're, we're probably going to be banging around in this yellow box for a little bit here. It feels like that's a, that's a half decent trading range for us for the next little while. Um, probably another way to look at this high to low trend line, and this was a tweet that I put out, is uh, 
You know, this this is a big monster of an asset now. I mean, it's got sort of a life of its own. And in a weird sort of way, I get the impression that this is what's happening here. So that's that same high to low trend line. Pretty significant trend line, eh? Um, so my hunch is, you know, like, did we just do something like this into here? And then we got to maybe work our way for a little bit and sort of saucer out underneath here? Well, that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, really, what I would ask is what sort of key support? What's key support? So it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't surprise anybody that we came up against these lows. And, you know, if you think, look left, and we start busting through these lows, you're going to see this should be a pretty nice fight. Interesting how we have this a pretty big tail in there. If we lose these lows, then you can see next stop is right back down against this, like, 30,000 area. Am I going to get into the business of predicting exactly what's going to happen here? That's a mugs game. I think that's just asking for trouble. I'll say that, you know, just as you can kind of see, spiky, 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 and then downside spiky, 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 spiky. Notice how, you know, it takes a few sort of attempts to sort of figure out where the hell the actual bottom is, and then we start heading the other direction again. Now, look at this one, right? This was like, and this is a daily chart, right? So that look at that. That was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then like here, we were closing right down at the bottom, eight, nine, ten. And then it finally turned back up. And you can see this one. Look at these spikies in here. So are we going to get some play in here? Somebody's asking, uh, it, what's the odds of this, this tail being eaten? I'd say probably pretty good. <laughs> oh will oh dang it. will will i think we found uh will's calling <laughs> i think it was was it was it will maybe there's somebody else anyway oh uh tafari tafari also too i i think that's i think that's our term for uh december <laughs> that's gonna be our term for december um <coughs> Our newest uh, admittance to the uh, the day trading room uh, at TRI. Um, uh, Will and Tafari are both uh, big on naked pox these days. <laughs> Still look cool. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some naked pox that they slammed into down here that basically stopped the bear. That wouldn't surprise me at all. So anyway, the point that I just make is, doesn't this kind of look like a sine wave? Uh, great. Oh, there's that great Del Moody guy. Hey, there's uh, Mr. Uh, I got to see what this book is that you're going to write out of all of these videos. <laughs> I, I sure hope I get like a 1% royalty or something. <laughs> I've told everybody this since the day of when I got into uh, crypto, but almost nobody. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, they, they always they sort of go, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, Brian. And then they go off and make a billion dollars and i never hear from them again <laughs> so you bet you there, there better be at least a liam one percent royalty in there <laughs> somewhere anyway just having fun with you um so you know did could we have hit some sort of pivot low here um and then we just sort of bump it along here i get the feeling that we're in sort of this part of whatever this thing's going to be so it wouldn't surprise me if there is some sort of back and forth through here i suppose if we're all bulls we don't really want to see the market break through this kind of level and through here if we made a head and shoulders and then crapped out here and also, too, what I thought was interesting was if you look at this price action and then compare it to this price action, there's that kind of big billiard ball kind of theory thinking I have. And I wonder whether this massive formation is actually nothing more than just a huge fractal. So I don't know. I mean, in fact, I think I even put out, uh, 
this kind of image. The problem with this kind of image is when you sort of put this kind of stuff out on uh, the public and the internet, oh man, you can really trigger people. So, I, you know, half of my comment here will be, okay, it'd be interesting to see what the emotional response is. Do I get a whole bunch of people that absolutely hate me and want to burn me at the stake? I mean, it happens in this crazy social media stuff. Um, the interesting thing about this is this doesn't necessarily have to end bearishly. Sometimes we get to the end of here and that the exact opposite happens. And the damn thing just takes off like a rocket and it's sort of, it's weird. It's like the formation is, it's a consolidation. That's the most important thing that you really want to take away from this is this is a, this is a very natural consolidation in price. Um, and, you know, like I said, that sort of massive formation, that is, I just literally took this price action, this market symmetry kind of study, and just copied the bar. So all this is, is this is just nothing more than this price action just reversed. You know, like think of like a maple leaf, right? All this is, this stuff over here, pure conjecture. There's where we are right now. And it's just asking, is this a fractal? Right. If it is, then the price pattern is going to follow something along these lines. So far, so good. So, you know, as we had sort of said a moment ago, inside this pattern here, we have this little back and forth period, sort of like this little mini left shoulder. Is that what we should be expecting now? I get the feeling that, yeah, maybe that's the case. So if we go back to... Um, that image that's down here and then you remember this was about a 10 15 day window i wouldn't be surprised if over the next sort of five to ten days we do something along these lines and then we have what's called uh, does anybody know what actually there's two this is okay so this will be your trivia and let's see if great del moody can answer the question if he's been paying attention <laughs> What is the period that we uh, attribute to often very violent price action right at the end of the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday period and the first week or so of uh, December? Famous speech, uh, Alan Greenspan, about uh, now... It is going to be almost 30 years ago. <laughs> well, thank you, Derek. I mean, you all know, you know what's so funny is every December we have this exact same conversation on the site. Every December, exactly the same conversation. <laughs> Nobody ever remembers. Anyway, so um, irrational exuberance is the, uh, thank you, Prince, is the, uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, is the sort of historical reference. But this is actually very typical price action for the first week or so of December, folks. You may... you No, not tax loss selling. That's different. Um, you may... So we stumped Great Del Moody. That's good. So uh, Great Del Moody, you got something new for the notebook. <laughs> it was worth turning it, tuning in this week. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and you, you should have a little section in your... Uh, in the book, uh, Famous Alan Greenspan Isms by the Beamish. Because <laughs> there's a ton of them. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, uh, following that period of weakness, what do we usually see after that? Uh, this will be interesting to see if you guys can clue in where I'm going with this. <laughs> well, Andre, great Del Moody is uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, get, do this on the cheap. I, you know, it's it, it's a cool uh, analogy that you can theoretically mine these shows, <laughs> but uh, and if anything, karmically, I like it because. I'm the, I'm like one of those guys. I was one of those guys when I was like in my 20s 
that I wanted to figure it out myself, and I didn't want to have somebody, you know, charge me a big old fat duh, wad of duh money that I didn't even know whether the, what I was buying was true because I had, I did, you know, like when I was in university, I bought the Mega Memory uh, course from that Trudeau guy, and I remember I saw that Trudeau guy. He's he's constantly on doing infomercials, one scam after another. I bought the, um, I bought the, uh, Ken, I mean, really, the first place I learned technical analysis. I bought the Ken Roberts course back in the 1980s. Um, turns out that, you know, the irony of it all is that 90% of those courses are just fluff. But there was a couple good things in Ken's philosophy. Number one, buy uh, uh, W, sell M's. Number two, 50% rule uh, retracements of 52-week ranges. If you just live by those two things and two things alone, you'll make lots of money in the market. But anyway. Uh, okay, so what the hell was I saying there? Oh, yeah. So what's uh, after irrational exuberance window? What's the next window we should be thinking? This is, this is the good window. <laughs> irrational exuberance is the bad window. And this is the good window. So who who uh, who uh, knows what what where Brian's thinking next? No blow off top. All dead. Tax loss selling. Hey, there's a party. <laughs> uh, well, theoretically, it's been snowing for a while. So buy when it snows. And I have seen sort of generally accumulating uh, accumulation in stocks. Uh, so actually, I, I I think that makes sense. Like even uh, crypto stocks, most of them are well off their lows. So I think I, that we have seen by what it, what I'm thinking here now is I'm thinking uh, Santa Claus rally. So uh, usually the period from eh, about the middle of December uh, in through you know that uh, sort of Christmas uh, weekend, usually you get a bit of a bump up in the risk asset market. And the same thing with stocks, the same thing with crude and commodities. My hunch is, what this says is, beginning of December, choppy choppy like this, 10 days. And then we'll probably work our way back up and be flirting with this trend line from both sides uh, over the course of the next couple weeks, maybe two or three weeks. And, you know, probably in through that Christmas weekend, uh, we'll probably see some sort of, usually markets relatively happy. I mean, not terribly unhappy, but usually pretty happy. Um, and then, what sucks, you know, usually OKCoin okay has a nice little surprise for uh, the Bitcoiners uh, Christmas morning. <laughs> and sometimes... We get punched in the nose right on Christmas Day. Thanks, OK Coin. Love you. <laughs> so, be forewarned. If anything, we should probably uh, set our watches for anybody who watches the coin closely and day trades and stuff for uh, when is the OK Coin uh, contract expiry coming up? Because uh, I've often seen uh, and and the, there's there's a number of these forwards markets and forwards contracts and stuff that are coming up. So uh, be forewarned of that. Um, in the short term here, something interesting developed out of this because uh, I've been sort of talking on the site, and this, this was my sort of take on this, is that I thought actually a lot of this price action had everything to do with the fact that these Ethereum futures contracts, the mini contracts, uh, were coming to market here uh, this week. That, that's what I thought the big catalyst this cycle was all about was Ethereum and this uh, micro futures contract that was going to be listed by it. So I did find it interesting that the sell-off in Ethereum actually got going in earnest through Friday and it became sort of almost like a sell the rumor. But if it's a sell the rumor, then what's the other side of that? How does that expression go? <laughs> oh, well, way to go. Now, I, that's the great part about this. Great Del Moody's there. Like, if it makes you feel any better, I'll sign up when I have a couple bucks. You know what makes me feel better? I've already won at this. Everybody, please, anybody listening to this video, this whole project after JoJo passed and my sort of what the fuck am I going to do with this stupid life? It's, it's been vindicated. 
And if if everything ended today, I've done what I was supposed to do. There is no shill here whatsoever. And if anything, great Dal Moody guy, and hopefully there will be others. We have so much free content out there. We have so much free information on YouTube. There should be other great Dell Moody's out there. There is no monetary incentive here whatsoever from my perspective. The only thing, of course, I've, I've wanted to try and do was I got this beautiful little special needs boy and I don't want him to have to fucking spend the rest of his life living in an institution. So I kind of wanted to get a nice little house for him here locally and set up all the supports and stuff so that he doesn't have to live in a hospital kind of environment. Right. He's not living in that kind of environment right now. But the problem is, is that, you know, if I pass away or something like that, I don't know what the future is going to hold with him unless I actually go and buy the damn house and put it in a trust and, you know, it's all funded and stuff and then we know he's going to live there. So that's the only motivation I have out of all of this, guys. Please understand that. And frankly speaking, I think the universe has heard my request. And crazy-ass shit like this Luna. And uh, Sjord's uh, wonderful love affair with uh, Do Kwan <laughs> and the lunatics. You know, I think that's going to facilitate that. Um, so if anything, I challenge you guys... <laughs> To be a great Dal Moody. The issue here, though, is being a great Dal Moody is not easy. That's tough, tough work. It's a lot of time and effort. I mean, the guy has shown up for these videos day in, day out for, geez, probably a good couple of years, just constantly taking notes. And, I'm, and I picked up on that, and I've been spoon-feeding him any time I can. No offense, dude. Love you dearly. You're awesome. Um, but... 99% of us in the world are not great Del Moody's. We can't do what he's doing. <laughs> so, way to go, man. And I'll tell you, if I, when I was 20 years old, if I had somebody like Grimm to sit there and all I had to do was just sit and listen to these pre-recorded lectures, and I, I think I know my shit and I think I can talk pretty well, then all you had to do was just come and listen to Grimm talk to you live once a week for like three months and you got all of this stuff on record and, you know, you can listen to Brian blah, blah, blah endlessly. I think I would have, I, who knows where the hell I would be in this universe. The irony of it all is probably none of you would even know me. <laughs> uh, I'd be living on a different planet or something. I'd be a fly cook on Venus, as uh, Ferris <laughs> said. So maybe, maybe that's half the reason why I am here, is because I'm supposed to be here to, to give you this ability, great Del Moody's in, of the world. So, uh, I don't know. I, I have no idea if that, that spoke to any of that sort of vein there. But hopefully that helps you, get, help you, helps you guys understand that um, and I, it might be a function of what the 1% are doing to us here that makes us lose our sort of humanity through this. And uh, they're going to make life uncomfortable, difficult. Um, if anything, hopefully what I am in a weird sort of way is uh, maybe I can just be sort of like, hey, that guy's he's weird. Uh, he's different. But at least he's not getting sucked into this insane political vortex that we're living in right now. You know, this sort of what I'm even seeing now is like literally... The people that produce content for public consumption are incredibly sort of swayed. Uh, you know, there, there's terms for these things, you know, um, and that, uh, the virtue, 
all that kind of stuff. And if it's one thing, I certainly am not. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 I mean, I, if you're in the hangout here, you look at my image and you can see it. Like I've got my camera on. I'm not virtuous. <laughs> That's the last thing in the world I am. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, I'm a nut. Okay, so uh, actually what we're supposed to be doing here today is, uh, well, yeah, but the, the, I mean the sad part about that online trading academy is that's actually usually how this story goes is they sort of say, uh, look, if you follow this cookie cutter model and do exactly what we tell you to do, you're guaranteed to make money and so people throw tons of money at them, but trading doesn't work that way. And the worst part about trading and really, uh, how do we, how do I describe trading? You know, probably the best way to think about trading and investing and making money from trading and investing and all that kind of stuff is you're, you're, you're learning a sport. Maybe uh, you're learning how to play a musical instrument. So you're in a weird sort of way, you'll get really good at trading when you concentrate on being good at trading. You'll make a ton of money and people look at you driving your fancy cars and you know, you got your beautiful women with the diamonds and the pearls and all that. But that's an offshoot of being good at trading. Kind of like, you know, uh, if you were at like a nightclub or something like that and somebody just jumped up on the stage and started, uh, you know, uh, playing the keyboards or something, you know, people aren't going to be dancing around the club to you unless you're pretty good at the keyboards, <laughs> right? Or mute piano or whatever. Then, of course, all the women throw their panties at you, etc., etc., and the rest takes care of itself. So I think, you know, trading is the same thing. It's, it's, it's more important to just get really good at trading, at the process. So not quite sure why I went off on that tangent. I was talking about something. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, like the, uh, so the online trading academy kind of things... What the number one thing that they're not going to teach you, and it's if anything, I love the fact that Grimm really is has made this an integral part of his uh, teaching with the uh, level oneers is the whole idea that really you don't probably even know what the hell you're doing until you've done like about a hundred paper trades, a hundred, and he's even like I don't even want you back testing. I don't want you hitting the replay button. I don't want you uh, hitting the replay button. I want you sitting there real time. I'm going to, like this, I'm going to buy this trend line here. And I don't even know if this will even work, but let's say, uh, I don't know, let's say I'm gonna buy that point there. And I'm going to, uh, no, that's never, where was, okay, well, there we go gonna risk uh, to the bottom of the range. I don't know if this is gonna work or not, right? This is half the job we do is with these setups is to try and figure out uh, three reliable reasons and I'm gonna try and risk to like say a two to one risk reward. Is this a trade I would do, a setup that I would uh, talk about? Not really, but I'm just throwing it on there. And the point is, you just got to take the trade and you got to live with the results. What is going to happen? And you have to watch it in real time because then that way, I mean, half of the problem, and uh, Grim made a really, really good comment today. People who backtest, you have sort of an unfair advantage. You already know what's going to happen. You already know the outcome. And, you know, studying something which takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and it's a pain in the fucking ass... But studying it in real time and logging it in real time, you will definitely know how this is going to play out and how your emotions are going to be through the whole trade. So um, anyway, so proud of the group that we have. Got to say, these people, they're really down to earth. They get it. I love it about them. There's no bullshit. Um, and, the, you know, we're not here to grind you, you know. I think we figured the the weekly cost for the program is like something like a hundred, hundred and fifty bucks. I mean, seriously? 
to learn a process that will change your life. I had somebody that basically came and and uh, this person um, um, I don't want to I don't want to give away who it is, but one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. So that's that uh, that that. Uh, interestingly enough, at TRI, that doesn't really limit a lot of people. These people are so good. Okay, that could have been any one of these clowns. <laughs> but uh, absolute angel of a gentleman. Um, and uh, he he literally put both the time and the mental and uh, capital into the whole cycle and he went through the whole bear cycle and then he went through the whole bull cycle in crypto and that's where the guys make just shitloads of money is if you can get yourself into the market at the at the end of the bear cycle and the beginning of the next bull cycle i heard the other day the guy cleared 20 million from the market recently 20 fucking million dollars <laughs> So, uh, I this works. It's just you have to be patient and you have to be disciplined and you have to not want it tomorrow. If it takes that you have to spend the next four years of your life learning and seeing what a market top looks like, seeing what a bear market looks like, see what a market bottom looks like, see how the venture capitalists act through all the different cycles and then start to see what the new technology is the uh, the next cycle see which how exchanges act i mean i'll tell you there's going to be a few pretty big fundamental changes coming up in, over the next couple of years in this space and i don't know how the hell it's going to play out so but the point is is you got to go through the whole process you want to make a bazillion dollars at this you got to put the time and effort in it's just that simple as that you just got to do it anyway blah 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 okay um what i do want to do is um the uh the uh, q a document and I even asked, uh, we had a couple of people from the level two program and the level three program had questions. And I was like, you know, feel free to throw the uh, questions in the document. See if you can stump Brian. So I don't know what kind of document, uh, what kind of questions we're going to have this week. They could be all over the map. Um, well, or there could be none. Yeah, look at that. Not many. So it uh, doesn't look like I'm going to have too much taxing here today. Uh, if anything, kind of cool to see um, another sort of term of the school coming uh, to an uh, you know a finish. Uh, another big whack of level three years are getting ready for uh, their final exam. Actually, they're working with the Dom right now, um, and uh, and um, getting ready to. Uh, spread their wings as site veterans super cool to see uh actually i think derek derek's in our level three program so uh he should be getting ready for his final uh, and actually i'm really pleased to see uh, zach has come along really nicely um as uh as a level three instructor um i think he's gonna do a really good job this coming term and Ray, I think, uh, is going to settle into the uh, TA spot in the Level 3 program. So super, uh, super cool to see the site constantly evolving. Um, looks like there's only a couple questions, so that's cool. Pretty simple. Uh, okay, uh, first off we got here, could you explain what leaving money on the table or left money on the table means? Um, well... See, that's a, that's a sort of an expression that you sort of think about in hindsight. So, uh, uh, let's say I was, um, I don't know, let's say hypothetically I, I bought this uh, consolidation right in here. Actually, that's not the best chart. Let's maybe go find a clear chart that we can use. Um, actually, you know, this isn't bad. Um, and it doesn't really matter. It's not that important. 
But let's say for one reason or another, I had a buy signal here and I bought. Oh, look at it. It's going up. It's going up. And then I go, well, you know, uh, markets are probably going to rally up and test that high. Probably going to fill this gap in. So I'm going to place my sell order right there. And sure enough, market goes up and ding, 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 ding. I get filled. So then I sit there for two or three days thinking I'm all the man and all the shit. And I'm like, okay, and it's going to pull back down into here. And I'll just go and buy the position back on this gap fill here. And the market says, no, nah, I don't think so. And heads higher. So let's say, I don't know, hypothetically, um, uh, let's say uh, I sold on that closing day right there. Market closed at, uh, what's that close? 38 cents, right? Right in there, 38 cents. And uh, let's say I had 10,000 shares. So that's like, what, 3,800 bucks? I think it's uh, something like that. Um, so now I would look at my account statement and you see it says 45 cents. I sold at 38, it's now 45. I might say I left $700 on the table. So that's, that's a way of thinking about it's sort of like, well, I already got out here. Uh, I, if I had sold today, it would have been here. So that's profit that I left on the table. I don't know if that's a good example or not. It's probably the same sort of. It, usually it's, uh, I ended up selling too early. <laughs> and the market went far further beyond. I suppose, you know, probably like uh, Luna right now is probably a good example where um, one could say, I mean, I followed my plan, but let's say hypothetically, I was sitting there um, and I had made the conscious decision that Luna was going to top right here where I sold um, right here. Uh, let's just say instead of this being a double level, this was, just, uh, I said, this was the top and the market goes zooming up here. So I can make the argument that I've left this on the table. Probably be a good way to look at it. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know whether that helps. Uh, let's see if the person who asked the question is here. Where is that? That was over here. So, um, yeah, let's, it, it's like, uh, let's say I had like a, a, a two to one risk reward. So I decided to get out that. I could have realistically had a three to one realistic uh, profit um, uh, uh, objective and I didn't. So it did go up there. And so I left that kind of money on the table. And really, it's um, it's a reference to poker and, and gambling. So I don't know whether that uh, that helps you there. Um, hopefully it does. Hopefully you're here. You can say yes or no. Number two, in regards to only the Willy indicator, is market structure crossing the EMA coming out of stupid sufficient analysis or do we need divergence as well? Uh, it's not really, it's not really required. Um, all like the whole point of divergence is it's like, oh, hey, this market, even though price is heading lower, it's actually stronger than what, than what price is leading you to believe. That's, that's kind of a, that's like a, a, a cool little hack you know like um you know if you're playing like a video game or something and you know that if you jump at a certain point a magic mushroom will pop up out of nowhere and you get an extra bonus life or something you know so just think that that's the way i want you thinking about divergence it's not like you know i i'm not gonna make money from trading unless i'm trading a divergence it doesn't work that way i mean hell you could just close your eyes and hit the buy or sell button randomly and trade. I mean, if you wanted to really, that's nothing more than just, you know, basically just random, you know, throw a dart at a dartboard. 
<laughs> I've often told people, if you can come up with a system where throwing a dart at a dartboard produces accurate results where you can get a two-to-one risk-reward, uh, more than uh, even 50%, if it's like 55%, I'll listen to you. The problem is, is that random is random, and theoretically, it's just a coin toss. The key, really, to making money from trading is that whole idea that if you're right, you get paid $2, and if you're wrong, you lose a dollar. So I think I even told you there's a really good analogy of... Uh, of a Wall Street guy, he said, I can, I can, technical analysis is completely pointless and I can prove it. And he took a, a dartboard and he painted the top half black and the bottom half white. And he said, I'm going to blindfold myself. I'm going to throw the dart at the dartboard and um, it's going to tell me whether to buy or sell. Hey, now that's pretty professional money management, isn't it? The key was, that when he bought, he was not going to take profits and sell until he saw at least two to one over the amount of money he was going to risk on the trade. It turns out that, yeah, it was about 50% accurate, winners over losers. But because of the two to one, you tell me, did he make money? Did his account balance go up? Anyway, it's a little bit of a side topic, but it just goes to show that the statistical uh, accuracy is not really the most important thing here. The most important thing is when you are right, you get paid relative to when you're wrong. So is the trade predicated on it, the market being in divergence? No. But what does divergence suggest? And this is the most important thing about this. It's really more a question about your psychology and what you perceive as the probability of your desirable outcome happening. And it turns out that if you hunt situations where there is either momentum divergence, price momentum divergence, volume momentum divergence, Hell, you can even have a volatility uh, momentum divergence. Um, it produces one thing we as a, uh, traders live by. Does anybody know what that word is? <laughs> there you go, Andre. Wow, Andre's really going. Uh, what's going on over here? <coughs> I only paper traded during level one through three. Well, that was smart. Someone please slap me so I can wake up out of my slumber. I know I can do this, but I'm having such a hard time even paper trading. Well, Santos, all you got to do is just get in the lounge. I don't know. Oh, you should be like a regular person in the lounge. Just get to know us. Hey, you come in there and you just say, hey, Brian, uh, I, I, I'm here to do this. I'll just say, you know what your number one job is? You got to show up. So just say every single day, hey, Brian, I'm here. And I'm like, great. What's your trade idea of the day? And I don't even care whether it's right or wrong. This is exactly what I told you at the beginning of level one. I don't care whether you make money or lose money. What you have to do is you have to get into the habit of saying, this is where I'm going to enter the trade. This is where I'm going to be proved wrong and I'm going to get stopped out. This is where I'm going to take profits if I'm right and get paid at least two to one. That's what you have to learn. The only person who can force you to do that, Santos, is you. You just got to get in there every single day. And if it's just like, hey, Brian, I'm here. Awesome. That's all you got to do. Pretty easy. It's so easy, though, that it's difficult. Because what it means is you have to be consistent. You just got to show up every single day. Don't have an opinion. My suggestion for you, and I tell everybody on the site, everybody in the school program, you do not know what you're doing here until you've been here for one full year. 
And Santos, you have to show us that spreadsheet of 100 paper trades. If you show me a spreadsheet, I would even say of 20 paper trades, by time 20 rolls around, you're going to have a pretty good idea of what it is you're supposed to be doing. The first 10 of them might be absolute garbage. And Frank, I've told you, I don't care. What you're here to learn is the process. So, uh, and I see Andre there, he's trying to help you. He said, uh, I only paper traded during level one through level three, smart. Then I traded with one tenth of 1% account and took a year until I was feeling solid, good. You know, I like the idea of the 2020 approach. Then this is, of course, for people who are not making mistakes. I would say if you did that 100 paper trades, your first 20, 30, 40, 50 trades are probably going to have mistakes in them. So you can't count them. But if you can get to the point where you understand the process and you're like, okay, I can log these, I can take them without making mistakes, then I say you do 20 paper trades, no mistakes, then you do 21 a tenth account size trades, no mistakes. Then, and that's 40 trades trading a setup. Then you can move on to 20 like full size account trades. And remember, even full size account trades, you're only risking like 5% of whatever your stake is max. You know, I would say most day traders, they risk maybe like a half a percent. 1% of their capital. And that way, if all hell breaks loose, they still never break that 5% rule. So, uh, let's see. Andre says, I would recommend rewatching the entire Level 1 course plus group tutorial sessions. I rewatched Level 1 through 3 multiple times and took notes and paper traded a lot. Hey, this Andre guy, man, he's a pretty good salesperson for the course. When you say just start the process, can you give me an example of what you're talking about if you don't mind and it's okay with you? I can send you my email and you can help me on the side. Well, I would say, Santos, it's better to be in the community. Do it in the lounge. You have the whole darn community to help you. And these people will be more than happy to help, Santos. Why do I get the impression Santos actually isn't a member of the community? <laughs> I'm getting the impression Santos is, uh, is maybe asking if he can move his education off-site a little bit. <laughs> Good luck, Santos. Santos L. Helper, if that is your real name. <laughs> and thank you, Andre. Heart of gold uh, for, uh, for uh, um, trying. Uh, to help totally awesome yeah there's josh saying santos we're in the lounge every single day josh is josh is he'll help you totally he's a sweet absolute sweetheart <clears throat> all right so uh anyway santos uh he got quite a bit of help there today probably more attention than he was expecting <laughs> all right let's move on uh yeah ah, well neither do you either too hey eh? colleen's here uh, in the uh, hangout here. She's a deer. The only problem is, Santos, uh, she's not going to let you get away with shit. <laughs> okay, so back to our question here. Um, the purpose of Willie primarily is just simply to show me markets that are distinctly overbought or oversold, and it works really, really well in that regard. So... Um, Where's the best place? Actually, I could probably show you here. Here we go. So I like to actually use RSI and Williams Percentage R in conjunction. Um, and when I used to trade with RSI, I actually used to speed up RSI. I would have it as a seven period. And then when you do that, it actually acts more like the Williams Percentage R. Uh, it's a lot crisper. It's a lot faster signals. Um, but of late, I've been having a lot of fun. Uh, Sjord, our CTO at TRI, uh, he got me to sort of pay attention to Bollinger Bands on RSI and really hunting for these very specific situations. 
uh, where you have volatility come out. I guess that's not a bad example right in there um, as uh, pivots. And uh, that's been a fun way for me to use uh, RSI lately. Uh, but to, to all intents and purposes, uh, Williams percentage R and, and Willie, it's real. It's, it's primary purpose is just simply to, uh, identify overbought and oversold conditions. And I'll tell you when this thing identifies an overbought or, or oversold condition, uh, my statistical odds, the L tango uh, kind of thinking it goes way, way up. So, uh, so it's, it's become almost kind of like a security blanket now for me. I just, I like to know that, you know, here's a good example. Indicators going into divergence. You can see the RSI like that. And there's good old Willie stupid. Am I going to use the M and am I going to use the divergence in, in uh, the Williams percentage, the modified Williams percentage R indicator like this here? To help me time my trade? Maybe. I mean, it's really up to you. Like I said, I would prefer to default that job of finding that divergence to things like RSI and MACD, but that's me. But really, the most important thing here is just acknowledging that that moving average is into the overbought zone, and this is the, you know, you better be damn careful here. So I don't know whether that helps or not, but hopefully it does. Uh, where was that question sheet? Over here, yeah. Um, to consider a setup fired, let's assume I got two internals fired, but for location, for example, RC not reached yet, but another custom in location indicator was met. How should I look into that? Um, well, you know, the, the issue here is... At the end of the day, you have to figure out what settles. No, that's not the right word. What fills you with the least anxiety and the most confidence in taking the trade. And I'll tell you, just because you hear some clown go on... Um, uh, go on about the the virtues of uh, of you know this heavily modified Williams percentage R indicator, or uh, you know some guy goes on about uh, the wonderfulness of a specific statistical ratio um, that he uses this drawing measure to figure out on a price chart. Just because those things are there, that doesn't make them valid in your subconscious. Uh, because I've been playing this game so long, I've come to realize, and my subconscious come to realize that, hey, you know, these, these, this information is usable, is relevant. But what's gonna have to happen here is you yourself are gonna have to see this so often that your subconscious goes, hey, I've seen this before. I, I've i seen this goddamn Beamish guy point out every time this happens, that happens. It looks, son of a bitch, there it goes. Or, you know, not every time. We can't say stuff like that. but Quite often, right? So, point higher is the... My job is to set the table, and that is the salad fork, that's the steak knife, that's the soup spoon, that's your champagne goblet, whatever. And you need to know how to identify them, and according to Julia Child's school of proper etiquette, what is the appropriate way to use these tools? But that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your steak with a shrimp fork. I don't care. If it works for you, fucking A. The most important thing about this whole process, and this is why those, um, those uh, you know, trading academies, why they, you know, they're out of the box, buy this product and you're guaranteed to make money. That's why they, they don't work is there's no such thing as an out-of-the-box product that if you do exactly this, you're guaranteed to make a fortune. It doesn't work that way. 
The way it works is, okay, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that generally speaking, when these kind of criteria all develop, the statistical odds of the market pivoting are, are in your favor. And if you have patience and discipline when you enter seeing these general generalities and you, you force yourself to sit in the trade uh, until you see at least that two to one risk reward and you get into the business of trading where you're hunting setups, these criteria, and then you're looking for very specific payouts to actually exit the trade, you've changed the equation completely. It's, um, the key here though is that, you know, like, like what we're seeing here is, you're only gonna know this and what you're asking here, you're only gonna know this when you've put the time and effort in and you've done the paper trades and ironically enough, believe it or not, actually, you'll be able to answer this. I would, I'll know that you're ready to move on when I actually turn this question around and I ask you, well, what have you found in your analysis? And what have you found works best for you? Are there any things that have you seen in your studies that trigger you emotionally? Are there, you know, like uh, whenever I see inside bar fires, I get all excited, things like haramis and stuff like that. But, uh, and especially like engulfing patterns, come on the, come on the site and, uh, and, and just one day for fun in a daily brief say, Brian, what do you think of key reversals? <laughs> and just see what happens. <laughs> So, but the only reason why I go so crazy ape shit about it is because I've seen it and it speaks to me subconsciously. The irony of it all is I could go crazy about key reversals, but you look at them and you kind of go, I don't know what he's getting all excited about. Okay, yeah, I guess. All right, fine. There's one that got stopped out. So why, why should I blindly follow this? But it's what speaks to me as a trader, right? Um... It's, it's the stuff that resonates with me. And, you know, simply put, what I would say to something like this is, do we ever take a trade based on one reason? The answer, of course, is never. So if you're starting to get confluence at a certain level, like, ironically enough, if I was bullish of an asset, um... You know, John Bollinger used to always say uh, the most bullish thing an asset can possibly do is actually get overbought. So, you know, and it can stay overbought for very long periods of time. But I guess what I wanted to show you, I'm just going to draw it here for, because uh, I just want to illustrate. Uh, but what I guess what I would say is... Uh, if I have a, a range and I draw something like a, uh, you know, a reload zone, that implies that I'm thinking that the market will come down into here for trade location. Do something like that and away we go. But is there a situation where I might actually entertain coming in on an asset that looks like that? The answer is yes, it's not a reload zone. This is a trend continuation setup, or what I like to call the botch, right? And really what I'm looking for there, geez, it happens every time I, I draw this. You're looking for at least a minimum of 33% and no more than 66% to create that sort of a, B, C, D, trend continuation trade. So apples and oranges, and this is why I teach you in the level one program, I could have a trade set up, set up like this, and we don't come back to the reload zone. What I wanna see if it does look like this is I wanna see, of course, multiple lows for me to be able to risk against. So if I'm gonna buy here, I've got this guy helping me, this guy helping me, and this guy helping me, and I'll put my stop down below there. 
And also, too, I think Grim even said uh, he uh, requires in his bot setups that uh, you have things like momentum already pointing up in your momentum indicators uh, while this is forming. So simple answer to your question is I'm not like totally constrained to uh, hunt reload zone setups. I could be flexible to hunt sort of trend continuation setups which uh, I might argue this is a range trade setup, buying at the bottom end of the range, looking for a test of the top end of the range. This is a trend continuation setup, thinking that really this is nothing more than just the stairs on a huge staircase bull market. I look something like that, boom, 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 boom. It just keeps going up and up and up, staircase higher. I don't know whether that helps answer that question. Uh, so, you know, here, you know, if I start getting W's and indicators, three higher lows, we maybe we're sitting at the 50% rule. So if that's the case, then that wouldn't be RLZ, but that would be like um, a bot setup. That's your question? Bill, does that help you answer that question? I, you know what I really like is uh, what I teach you. Give me a location tool. It might be a moving average. And actually the level two program, I, mean, I guess you're in the level one, right? So if you're moving on to level two program, we give you in the level two program, we just give you a ton of trade location tools. So it's kind of ironic that you're kind of right now in the level one program, you're handcuffed with relatively few tools to identify trade location, eh? So in the level two program, we hit you with like moving averages, trend lines, <laughs> horizontal support and resistance, and of course, uh, trend channels, high to low lines, and then uh, moving averages, uh, then gaps, then volume profile. I mean, literally week after, then GAN, WD GAN, literally week after week after week after week, it's just one trade location tool after another, after another, after another. So, <laughs> sorry to do that to you. That's our big tease. Take the level two. <laughs> no, really not fair of us, but what the hell. All right, uh, let's keep moving this forward because I got to get off to Liam here soon. Okay, hi, Brian. I see these numbers on people's charts occasionally, and I don't know what they represent. Can you please explain what these numbers mean? Uh, what the heck is he looking at? This looks, is this uh, Tom DeMarc? Uh, these arrow, uh, uh, these numbers uh, on this study? Or are you talking about these the, the arrows? Um, I mean, simply put, and I wouldn't mind, uh, I don't know. How can you see that like full screen? I don't know how to do that. Um, oh, that didn't work. Anyway, uh, these numbers are, um, uh, uh, Fibonacci, uh, ratios. And uh, just as I just showed you there a moment ago, um, that's what these kind of numbers are. So you know, this is pretty basic stuff we uh, we do in the Fibonacci uh, week module. So I'm not quite sure why you wouldn't know this, but say something like there to there. There's the bottom end range, there's the top end of the range, and this tool is found right up here. It's the, what, one, two, third box down. I guess one, two, three, fourth box down. Favorite tracement, and you can set up a whole bunch of templates and like reload zones, right? Uh, that would be the reload short zone of that range, so let's flip that around. So for of this particular range, that would be your reload long zone off of that range. So those are those numbers. It's pretty straightforward stuff. A uh, little concerning that you'd be asking that kind of question in a level one program. The triangles that you see here are uh, fractals. So there's a, you know, in our candlestick module, um, 
we have uh, in the candlesticks, we introduce you to the Williams Fractals tool that helps you see fractals on your price charts. And all a fractal is, think of like a maple leaf, right? Looks something like that. All right, that's what a fractal is. Think head and shoulders, fractal. So that's what all of these are, both bullish and bearish. You can have a bullish fra or a, a fractal top. It looks something like that. You can define how many highs you want. This is like a three high, sort of like head and shoulders, head and shoulders top, head and shoulders bottom. You can also have a five bar fractal. Think of like a maple leaf. So that's basically what these diamonds are. And it's an indicator that you can put right on there. Again, we cover this in the uh, candlesticks module. So not quite sure why you would be asking that question. Other than that, uh, I don't see other numbers. It looks like they might have uh, pivot points on the chart here. I see S13. I'm not quite sure what that's in reference to. It might be pivot points. Uh, but other than that, I don't see any other numbers here. I don't know what that S13 now is. Like I said, that might be a pivot point study. So I don't know. Hi, Brian. I see these numbers on people's charts occasionally, and I don't know what they represent. So the numbers are blurry. Was this you? You asked this question, Bill? There is uh, also two. A fun little study that we like to do on uh, the charts. Let's see if I have my uh, template here. Uh, this might work. Called the Tom DeMarc sequ Sequential Indicator. <clears throat> and this, uh, I can't remember exactly how the definition goes. Um, where are we? Tom DeMarc. There we go. So it will put numbers right on the chart. Uh, and it's sort of counting, you know, if you think about relative strength index, although I don't see them on here. Oh, not quite sure why that's not loading. It should load. Let's see if I have it over here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's no good. Uh, let's try over here. Oh, this is my stock market one. There's Tom to mark there. Oh, it has an exclamation mark. I'm not happy. So maybe that Tom to mark uh, study won't work on this chart. Could be that that script's out of date. I don't know. Oh, there's a big exclamation mark. So uh, that Tom DeMarc study is uh, doesn't look like it's working. So um, there are other ones. I'm not really an expert at the Tom DeMarc. Uh, I breathe what? Um, anyway, point that I would just make here is uh, that could be the Tom DeMarc. And I know we do have stuff in the library. I know like... Uh, Julian, for instance, he was really, really excited about Tom DeMarc for a while. I think you can uh, come in here and you can actually get a... Uh, uh, I thought we did have a presentation on Tom DeMarc. I still remember we did. Maybe it's in here. So uh, Tom DeMarc is uh, it's uh, it's another you know it's another technical analysis tool that you can use to help you sort of understand uh, uh, price action. So I don't. It's funny. I could have sworn we had it. We had one in here. It's probably in here. I just can't even see it. Anyway, I do remember a while ago. You might even be able to go like uh, search in the video live recordings. I remember we ha we did do a presentation on, um, on it. I think that's how you spell it. There you go. So back in April. Yeah, that would be about right. You know, and there you are trading the nines, Tom DeMarc. So 
That's what you need to do. Whoever asked this question, if you're asking about Tom DeMarcus, go uh, watch those videos and all that kind of stuff. That should help. I'm not really an expert in Tom DeMarcus. Well, I'm not really. I'm not an expert in Tom DeMarcus. Simple as that. Uh, it's kind of fun listening to Julian and uh, people on the site getting all excited about the indicator. And on balance, I find it helpful, although uh, it looks like whatever indicator I'm using is, is incorrect and it's not working. So going to have to change that. So I don't know whether I answered that question, but uh, hopefully I did. Often I see people from the community talking about trading ideas like Julian on Tuesday. Sometimes I see market conditions where I want to take a trade with three reasons, but it is not but it is not a known set of bot or El Tango for which I know the statistics. What should we do with these trading ideas? Um, not a bad idea to actually create, you know, this is the great part about uh, your individual journey as a trader evolving. There's no reason why in your spreadsheet you cannot hit the plus tab. You know, like, uh, it's kind of fun. Even for you guys here, I created just these real idiot spreadsheets, you know, 6, 8, 12 months ago, just detailing all the different plans that we're running here. There's no reason why you can't just come down here and hit a new tab and say, this is my sexy sex setup. I don't know what the hell we're going to call it. But the point here is you can create setups anytime you want, anywhere you want. All that matters is it works for you. So you're going to write. Now, I would suggest everybody, we have how many reasons for a trade? Great, Del Moody says, the TD indicator counts candles and cycles, numbering them starting with one and potentially going up as high as nine. Thank you, sir. So there you go. Three. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> Three, God. Oh, all right, there you go. Three, good. All right, so we'll just say three unrelated reasons for my trade. Ideally, what do we want the first reason to be? JU5T says four. First reasons, good idea that it should be a location reason. Same thing as real estate, location, location, location. Second reason. How about something like an indicator confirmation? You can even do something along the lines of divergence. If you can have divergence, it's just going to give you edge. That's all this is, just edge. And then number three, some sort of structure and to frame risk. And the key with the structure, it, again, you know, if, if we ha see a W in price, Ws work a good 60, 70% of the time. That's a number I can live with. Doesn't It's not 100%. Get used to it. It just isn't. But 60, 70%, I can work with that. And the point of the W is at least it makes it pretty damn clear. Where am I going to enter? Where am I going to risk to? Those levels are tripped up. Away we go. That's all technical analysis is for. It, there's no other reason for technical analysis. People seem to think that technical analysis is the answer to the question. When all technical analysis is, is like a tool. I mean, you can look at the hammer and say, okay, how are we gonna build this house? And the hammer looks back at you and goes, I'm a hammer, I hammer. <laughs> technical analysis is not gonna make you money from trading. I can tell you that, absolutely guarantee you every fucking day of the week. What makes money from trading? 
you as a human being using technical analysis as a tool to implement your desires. Desires is you want to find situations where the odds are if you put your money at work, you can get $2 in payment for $1 of risk. And you want to see that at least, you know, a good 60, 60, 70% of the time. I mean, that's the way the game works. And the irony of it all is, let's see if we could do it. Everybody get ready to jump. How often do I have to be right if I force myself to get paid $2? If I'm going to take $1 risk in the marketplace just to be a scratch trader? Thank you. <laughs> uh, people in the hangout are jumping. They say, hey, there goes YouTube. Let's see them jump. Come on, you. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't I don't really. And the funny thing is, is you could come to me. And if you gave me a location reason, indicator confirmation reason, a price structure reason, you called it your sexy sex setup. And I, and you said, look at Brian. Here's a spreadsheet. Here's a, tray, uh, a list of 100 setups. Here's the chart. Here's the entry. This is where I took profits. This is where I got stopped out. Here's the end result. And it basically meets that 60, 70% criteria. I'll teach it in the fucking school. It, I, I, I have no ego in this. All I want to do is more of what works and less of what doesn't. I don't care whether it comes from fundamental school. I don't care whether it comes from the technical school. In fact, what I would say is... What happens if both of them happen to agree on direction? Does that edge get larger? Usually it does, so that's why I like to see good fundamental reasons coupled with good technicals, and away you go. Rational investing. So I don't know whether that helps answer the question. Um, if anything... This is a good question for you because what it's saying is, okay, I've, I've, I've learned these two setups and now I'm, I'm, I need to grow. I need to, I need, you know, like maybe you could argue that, uh, you know, like kind of like, um, you know, like a, how a, a, a caterpillar morphs into a, into a moth, right? And, you know, as you're sort of growing and you're the caterpillar, you've got these two setups and they're, you know, I'm sort of learning and I, yes, I'm trading them, but, you know, I keep seeing this other stuff that, that I want to, I want to trade. And I see that when this happens, that happens, but it's not in your stupid fucking setups, Brian, and it's kind of pissing me off. <laughs> What's that? Well, somebody's barking at me. I'm, I'm having fun because I'm getting all... You know, you guys just see the word, the, the word processor page, but <laughs> I've got the camera on in the uh, hangout. And actually, you know what? Gee whiz, man, I look rough. <laughs> I got to get bathed. What time is it? 12.22. Yeah, I got to get going here soon. So, so anyway, uh, the point being that uh, this is actually, I think, this is actually a good evolutionary step for you is you are going to get to the point where you're like, Brian, these setups are too limiting for me. I want to do others. I want to do other things. I want to. Uh, I love this volume profile, this notch. I love Hogue. I love trading megaphones. They're, they're like five to one risk rewards. And, you know, these are too constraining and I feel too locked in in this shit. That's perfect. That tells me that, number one, you're learning, you're growing, and you're now at the point where you can actually even spread your wings a little bit. Maybe you can teach us a setup or two. So I hope that helps. Uh, and by all means, let me know whether I am speaking to you, whether I am helping you with that. So. All right, can you please walk us through the RSI BB indicator that you use? I don't believe I've seen a tutorial on it. Yeah, because because I'm too lazy, man, you guys. I swear, every time I, uh, I get close to, uh, well, no, I wouldn't say that. I, uh, I've been repeatedly asked to uh, get off my ass and add a level four to this school program. So I think what's going to happen here, 
I'm going to get uh, Zach to the point where he's ready to be the level three instructor, and then I'm going to have to go write a whole, do, whole new <laughs> level <laughs> for this program because there's just so much more material. It never ends. And I keep getting asked for this, and I just keep putting it off and putting it off. But um, The interesting thing about this, I mean, yeah, you've, uh, I think we do have... Um, uh, past broiler chickens and daily briefs where I did go through the RSI model and the way that I used to trade it with uh, multiple M's and W's. So, you know, maybe uh, look back and refer to that. With regard to RSI, all I'm suggesting here is um, uh, with regard to Bollinger Bands is... Um, and the problem here is this probably isn't the best asset to look at because it's actually relatively just new in one direction. But you can kind of see it here if we zoom out. Notice how there's periods in this. You know, this here period here where the RSI, look how wide it is. I mean, that's it's hard to see. But you can see there to there, very wide. And more importantly, notice how the Bollinger Bands are expanding here. So this is an injection of volatility into price. Um, also too, you can see it here. We, don't, we want to avoid taking trades in these kind of windows where volatility is expressed. And you can even see it if you go like, uh, probably actually even easier to see it if we go like this. Uh, there. What you really want to look for with with investing in the markets, and it's so easy. I mean, it's remarkable how easy it is. You want to look for windows when volatility is coming out of price. Because what that means is that there's indecision in the marketplace as to whether the va the asset is is overvalued or undervalued it might just simply be that everything is stopped and buyers and sellers are just they've agreed on on fair value um, so when you get those kind of situations that's when you really want to pay attention so looking at this image all that really is is windows where you can see the Bollinger Band is contracting and contracting. This is a point at which you want to pay attention. Where basically everything is, the volatility is coming out of price. And you can see on the moving average itself, you can see that through this window right here, actually the volatility is almost negligible versus Look how this is like straight up right through there. Like, hi, yeah, 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 straight up. And then, of course, through here, straight up. You don't want to be investing your money through this window. If anything, when this happens, this is a massive repricing event. What do you think you should be doing up in this area? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> no one? Yeah, there you go. When the, what, how does the expression go? Oh, thank you, Wade. Well, I, uh, it's dangerous to short this because you don't know. This thing might just explode higher. You just don't know. But uh, maybe, maybe uh, this would be a better way. Great deal, Moody. I don't know whether you have this or not. But. When they're yelling and think of increased volatility coming into the market as, oh, holy shit, something's going on! Holy moly, something's going on! That makes sense? <laughs> All right, so the question here is, uh, what are we supposed to be doing when they are yelling? <laughs> Wait, you already you already answered that. Yeah, yeah, you, you you front ran my question. You can't say that because now you just gave away the answer. 
Now, does it make sense that if volatility is coming out of the market, like in this period here, things are calming down? Z, Z. Is that a time when people are yelling? They may not be crying, but I'll tell you, you want to make a lot of money in this uh, world. This, this is and this is why Johnny Bollinger does so fucking well. Is this is this is gold? If you can learn this concept of when to participate. So when to participate when volatility is very low, when not to participate when volatility is really high, man, you can keep yourself out of a lot of trouble in this world. It's really, really easy. So here's another example. Look at this cute little W right in there. Hey, cute little W, and you can see cute little W. Right? And you can see how the moving average kind of flattened out there. Same sort of thing here, you can see. Look how the volatility is contracting in here. You can see the moving average is kind of flatlining. These are the times when you want to participate and you want to avoid this, avoid that, avoid this. Well, I mean, that's not so bad. I would be thinking going the other direction here, not going short. All right, so. You know, back to our story, but like I said, this probably isn't the best one to use, but you'll see it actually a lot better when actually I just changed the chart to sort of like the full screen, so boom, right? And when you look at it like this, you can really see it well. Um, especially when I put the indicator on. Boom, right? Right through here. See how it's sort of calmed down through there? and compressed right there and it did it again right there and you can see it's doing it again so the question is are we going to take uh, and you can see it did it right here are we going to take the trade just based on this one reason alone right there what do you think That'd be a good idea just to take, hey, look at that, the bands are contracting. All right, that's it, go and buy this, but load up, all right? So why don't we, for argument's sake, say, you know, the Bollinger Bands are squeezing in there. Let's go look and see if there were any other supporting reasons to justify us paying attention right in here. And let's look at the price. If we do one of those crazy ass reload zones, oh, you ever heard of? There's some idiot on 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 the interneting, and I swear the guy goes on for like about two or three hours every fucking weekend, and he just talks endlessly, like total. No, I mean the guy. I swear I must love the sound of his own voice, but he keeps talking about this stupid reload zone concept. I don't know. What do you think? Would that be of any help here? No, oh, well. <laughs> There's that line that we drew that when the Bollinger Bands were contracting and volatility was coming out of price, maybe we should pay attention. Can you start to see how this is kind of lining up here, folks? <laughs> Some weirdo. <laughs> Uh, is there a letter of the alphabet that may be starting to form here? What happens if we change this to like a line chart? Oh, hello. I go down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Hey, whoa, oh, geez, that looks like it's Wing out. So, if anything, what I see here, and you know, this might even make it a little easier if you want to just go off a of line charts, so right? We can go like that. And we can go like that. So, again, reload zones. That sure looks like a W to me. What do you think the odds are maybe we got like bullish momentum divergences starting to form here in our momentum indicators? You see how MACD was just a train wreck here. And then we went to lower lows in price, but MACD did not. Oh, hello. 
And then we actually went and broke out. So the MACD's got a big W, even though price was making a lower low right there. RSI, there is a bullish divergence right in there. Lower lows, higher lows. All right, remember we were just talking about RSI. There is the divergence. There is the Bollinger Band squeeze. And, uh, you know, needless to say, uh, Seward would be very, very excited. I'd be willing to bet Seward would jump up and down. Uh, on number one on this W right there, that would get him excited. Then also, too, on the cross above the moving average here, that would get him excited. And my hunch is this huge breakout here would also get him excited. So, oh boy, a whole bunch of bullishness all through here. So do you see how all of that just so happens to line up and it gets you buying in a reload zone? What a shock. I mean, you want to wait? Just buy that little W break out there off of the mountain man level? That's fine. So what do you think? Hopefully that helps. And actually it turns out that Luna example was, was perfectly fine. So hopefully you uh, understood how that works. Hi, Brian. I know that you have said before that the Forex market is a scam. I never said it was a scam. That's not that's not the right word. What were your experiences with it? And two, what advice would you have if someone was to trade it on a small time frame swing trade for a funded account? I've completed level two and going to do level three with markets have calmed down a bit in bear market. Thanks. Well, what I would say first and foremost is you have to understand what the Forex market is. And I don't think a lot of people even understand what the hell Forex even is. So for the record, what it is, is it's basically just a network of telephones. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Just a whole bunch of trading desks all connected by a telephone wire. They all happen to be bank telephones. And it was a convenient, easy way for banks to move massive amounts of money, uh, what they used to call the interbank lending market. Is It was never designed for the public. But so the problem is, is there was like this great move for deregulation back in the late 70s, early 80s. Actually, late 60s, early 70s. And they literally deregulated everything. So what a surprise. The public and, you know, really the capitalist said, what the hell? Why don't we let the public in on the Forex market? They want to get into this so bad. The problem is the Forex market, all it is is just a network of telephones, just a network of a bunch of traders. They all have inventories of various different denominations of these fiat currencies. And they're just moving billions of dollars back and forth amongst the banks. And the problem is, is that the consumer and, you know, to a certain degree, aided by the Joey Diamonds of the world, because they know fat fees, fat commissions. <laughs> the public is clamoring to get into this market. OK, fine, we'll let them in. But totally unregulated. So uh, I've often uh, we have actually a setup called the SFU setup which would work really, really well in, um, in uh, a Forex, I would imagine. Mind you, it works in every market. And it's just simply, uh, you are going to, you know, like uh, if I, you know, the SFU simply says uh, every single high and low that you see on these charts is nothing more than a liquidity pool. So uh, if I was going to trade, say, you know, like, I'm, you know, we have fun day trading the uh, futures markets on the site. Uh, and actually, you know what I think I want to do? I think in the new year, my goal is I want to go back to Top Step and uh, get uh, refunded on one of their uh, combines. I think that's what my big goal for the new year is. But... Um, if we look at, and crude oil, keep in mind, crude oil, oh boy, these guys, they love to screw with the kids. But, you know, you can make the argument, like if I'm looking at a lower time frame chart, <clears throat> that, you know, all of these lows, they're all technically liquidity pools, and all of these highs are liquidity pools, and quite often, you know, this is probably a really good example, 
that this move down into here was nothing more than just what they call, uh, then we went after the stops. And they ran the stops out, and then they take the market back the other direction. So it, if you're going to trade a trade setup in Forex, I would recommend that you hunt this uh, particular setup, the SFU, because the problem with uh, Forex is because it's unregulated, there technically is no such thing as the last trade. What it is is nothing more than bids and offers post, posted. So what ends up happening is because there is technically no last trade in Forex, you see this high here. It says 68.96 there on the crude oil, that high print right there. And what is that? Yeah, 68.96 there. As a trader, right, we'd be like, okay, well, that's an M, so we want to sell the break of the M, right, and we want to put our stop just above here. But if there's no last trade, then price could come up here, and the Forex, you could have your stop up here, right, let's say uh, 90, what do we say, 98.96 is the uh, high, I'm going to have my stop at 98.98, we'll give it two ticks higher. And if there's nothing on the order book for the Forex house, they can fill your stop loss order even though the price in the marketplace never trades at that level. So how the hell are you supposed to work stops? If they can just come and arbitrarily, if, you know, and especially with these uh, you know, Forex houses, they're often just fly-by-night operations. There's only a few guys working. They're under the premise that the public loses money consistently, which they do. They're also operating under the premise that because the public constantly loses money, that it's perfectly fine for them to take the other side of the trade. And then by definition, if they take the other side of the trade, the public's always losing money, then by definition, they're making money, right? It's not a bad business model. The only problem is when some smart-ass, punk-ass bitch from TRI comes along and knows how to trade. <laughs> and we had one guy on the TRI site who literally brought one of these CFD Forex houses to its knees and bankrupted the place. <laughs> one day, he goes to log into his account and it's gone. Everything. There's not even a fucking whisper <laughs> of the place even left. It's gone. So you better be careful what you're dealing with. And the funny thing is, is if you know how to trade and you're making money from trading, odds are you might just actually put these cocksuckers out of business. <laughs> be careful. I've seen it happen before. <laughs> But the worst part about Forex, that's not the worst part. I mean, hell, if, if the guy's going into business uh, and uh, and he's opening up in his shop and you know how to come take his money, okay, fine. You know, take his money. Who cares? But the worst part about Forex trading is that whole idea that this, you could have your stop, like I said, this high there, and that's a perfectly legit double top. That high there, 96, you could have your stop at 98. The market could come working up here. It will never trade there, but in Forex, they can fill your stop loss order, which is a total and utter piss off. And that's why I never, ever, 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 ever trade Forex. It's just not worth it. And now that they have these like micro and, and, and microscopic <laughs> size Futures contracts, I don't think there's any need to trade the Forex market. This the, the futures market's gotten small enough now that I think it's worth the opportunity cost. And this is just my personal belief. Like, I personally think the best way, and actually somebody even asked this in the level one class today, and I think it was a really good question. What's, what's sort of the natural, the best evolutionary process? Is it a good idea for you to just jump into trading, trading your own account? full time? And I actually think the answer is no. I think that if you're really serious about this money management business, that the next logical step, if you really fancy yourself a day trader and you want to go down that path, 
the next logical step is to actually go to one of these prop firms and see if you can get funded. It might take you years of just getting to the point where you can actually pass their, yeah, okay, you know what you're doing, you're ready to manage real money. Because trust me, there is a lot of emotional shit that comes out you think you've got your shit together, but as soon as you start dealing with real money and something bad happens, you can literally, I've seen people blow themselves up in a heartbeat. So, you know, I actually would recommend that you go the prop firm route. And uh, the problem is finding a prop firm where the guys aren't assholes. <laughs> it's it's tough and you know the trading you know not everybody is so nice as tri uh you know even the, the prop firm that i worked at uh top step uh with john hoagland i think john hoagland's an absolute sweetheart and addy van horn if you can work with him uh he's he's gonna be like a remembered icon of the late 20th century and uh, if you even have the opportunity just to hang around with him a bit it would be worth it but uh i like those guys but the the guy who leads the place he's a typical trader guy and he's you know he's serious and he's not really the most friendly guy until you start making him money and then all of a sudden he's your best friend you know typical capitalist so, uh, you know, I would, and all of you aspiring level oneers, you know, your big aspiration should be, I need to work on this until I can get to the point where I could go to top step and actually pass one of their cost, uh, combines. Simple as that. And I think I might like actually work harder on that uh, going forward. Um, you know, maybe I'll get back into the habit of hanging out with uh, the Top Step crew first thing in the morning again. Uh, they're pretty good at that, at facilitating that next leap for all you aspiring serious traders. So, um, yeah, I'm glad actually I thought about that today. <clears throat> all right, let's uh, keep moving on here. What time is it? i got a few more minutes. Um, okay, so yeah, we talked about that. Um, what's your advice if you have someone was to trade on a small time frame swing trade it for a funded account? Yeah, so uh, you heard me talk a little bit about what I would suggest. I think that the futures industry now is robust enough that it can handle even really small accounts like those micro size accounts. And my suggestion to you, whoever's asking this, is get your butt in the battle stations room every single New York kill zone, Monday to Friday, we're all in there doing our thing and just get into the habit, right? We gotta figure out what your day trading setup uh, preference is and then just get into the routine. And what you got to do is just build up muscle memory. And you just got to do it every single day. Just show up. You know, it's interesting. I was uh, showing you guys recently um, just this uh, spreadsheet that I've done. And I've kept track of even my day trading in the, uh, in the battle stations room. And it's interesting, you know, as we've been going through this... Um, through this, uh, where the hell is it? Through this uh, period, just over the past week or two, um, where I really haven't had a heck of a lot to do since the 21st of November. I've been kind of just, you know, through this whole holiday period. Setups are just not coming in for me. But so fucking what, right? That's just the way. It's a trader's life. You got to show up, and it maybe you're. You're uh, you show up and the and the and you know the 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 write up for the day is no setups came in nothing to do, so be it that's the way it goes. So uh, my and then like I said I think I'm liking the idea that I uh, I'd like to uh, get sort of back into uh, posting the uh, the uh, the top step uh, room sort of morning rant with uh, with Johnny Hoagland that that was a good habit that we were all in, into there for a while so I might get more into doing that uh, going forward here. Um, so, stuff for you to think about. Really what I want to see is I want to see you in that battle stations room every morning for the New York kill zone. 
All right. Uh, hi, Brian. What is your opinion about Ka Akasha? It looks like shit. <laughs> Fucking thing's breaking down. Uh, I don't like anything in crypto right now. The whole fucking crypto market is rolling over here. It looks brutal. So uh, I'm actually humming and hawing about whether I want to blow that thing out, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm not really in love with anything that I see in crypto right now. And uh, I did, there was one name that I've been buying here recently. Um, and... Um, and that was Danny's name here. This is the only thing that I've been buying. And I actually got another fill here through this dump. <coughs> this thing, buying against these lows here. This is the only thing in the market that I've been buying. And that uh, uh, Akasha that I bought. And uh, it looks like shit right now. I'm gonna, I'll just be perfectly honest with you. I'm not happy with any of this stuff whatsoever. Um, and I'm thinking about just blowing it out, especially like these, the MIR. This one looks bad. And the problem with this, if I understand correctly, is that tokenomics, right? Or they, this thing doesn't have to have any value. And if the stock market goes into the shitter, this thing could just fall right apart here. So I might, don't be surprised if you hear that I just liquidated this on any kind of dead cat bounce into uh, these this, these peaks here. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me <gasps> whatsoever. I might just even bail on that now. And then there's AKT. looks like poop as well. Now this one's got, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's got, well, yeah. Don't look good. But versus Bitcoin, we've got relative floor here still hanging in. But I'll tell you, that, that does not look bullish whatsoever. Uh, and versus cash... Uh, yeah, we had this key low here that was uh, that was in place a while ago. And you can see on that meltdown the other day, they just smashed that low like a bitch. So I don't like either of them. And, and there's not much in crypto that I do like, to be honest with you right now. This looks uh, problematic. Told you guys before that, uh, you know, this uh, Bitcoin... Um, Thought maybe we had to come down and uh, play with the big fat round numbers, play with those long term trend lines. You know, somebody mentioned that that tail probably ultimately will be eaten. So, my hunch is for the next little while, this is going to be super volatile all through here. And, like I said there a few minutes ago, not until we get at least some sort of consolidation. And this one took, you can see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 days from sort of the beginning of entering into this range. It took 11 days to turn back up. So over the next 10 days, I'm not expecting anything out of this space. It just looks like poop right now. And now the Ethereum did break. And it's interesting, we talked about Ethereum uh, and the futures event. So what I'm worried about was maybe was this a whole buy the rumor and then the event happened, sell the news. The one saving grace about all of this was that, like I said, I was a bit surprised to see that they dumped this Ethereum market into the close on Friday. And I guess it's going to gap lower here when this thing opens up. Uh, mind you, what is that? That's 4,200. Where are we? Yeah, or 4,150. Well, maybe they can bring it back. Um, and was the cat was was this the futures event listing of this? Was this the big catalyst here? I don't. I honestly don't know. Um, you know, we did have things like this inverted head and shoulders and stuff gave us these upside objectives. So those have been hit now. I mean, do we have to take some time now and sort of clean this up? Could we have to come all the way right back down to these levels? I don't think so. Uh, but just in the short term, you know, and that's probably, you can't even really see what the hell's going on there. Let's look at this one here, maybe a little better. In the short term here, do we have any letters of the alphabet that have fired here? We have it on an intraday basis. We got that tail that blasted through there. There's a lot of futures guys that would be enough for them to get excited. I would imagine a lot of crypto people, sort of like, you know, especially those people watching on-chain analysis, my hunch is they really want to see that clothesline, that clothesline, that clothesline, that clothesline. Maybe we need to see serious close down below all of these support lines before we give up on the bull. 
Also, too, if we're lucky, we might even have the smatterings of a bullish divergence trying to form here as well. So we'll see how that goes. That's encouraging for the bulls. <laughs> Um, still very early, right? We'd have to see this turn and then turn back up and break through this high here for me to think that that div is in place. If anything, what I see are probably, you know, our, our example of uh, uh, momentum and, and uh, you know, where are we in the stage of the move? These things are still pretty wide, which means there should still be a lot of volatility in the market. Uh, and we're not going to really, you know, again, remember I said like 10 days of consolidation. What you really want to see is you want to see the market sort of settle down for a little while and go sideways and then we'll get our next break. Right now, way too much volatility in the market. I don't think it's ready to do anything right now. Um, so, uh, simply put, a lot of crypto looks like shit right now. And uh, the uh, it's interesting that one thing that really surprised me yesterday, and I even put a tweet out to it, was I was actually quite surprised at the violent reversal that came out of uh, this thing yesterday. That was that was quite surprising. The only uh, like uh, you know this guy was this is there are not many of the names even uh, some of the 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 much beloved uh, DeFi names they couldn't withstand the onslaught yesterday like this uh, Cosmo I mean that M that looks pretty damn solid eh uh, this Avax it's got the M as well if I understand correctly. Did this Solana actually get caught in a lie? And that, you know, that might be a major reason uh, why this crypto market's a little bit suspect. You know, I did, I think I've told you guys before, there, you know, I did put a tweet out. There was, um, there was one sort of big rug pull that Andrew was telling me that happened recently, or maybe it was trying to be perpetrated and they, they avoided it um, through sort of social um, dis, uh, I don't know, shaming or whatever. But uh, I think I heard somewhere, didn't somebody say that these guys, uh, these guys, they were caught in some sort of lie or something? So... They, I don't know. Can anybody confirm what I'm saying here? Or am I just or am I hallucinating? I seem to remember there was something about this that happened. Anyway, what I would just simply say is there's a lot of technical damage done on these guys. But the one guy that seemed, and I have no idea why, but the one guy that seemed to avoid all of this was Luna and out of nowhere. And I was like, all right, well, that's it. The rally's done. I mean, Sjord, I hope you enjoyed the rally. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere... This thing just came to life and just took off, which I was quite surprised about. That really shocked me. Good thing is we're going down to lower time frames here. Don't see any massive divergence here, so that's good. But a little bit, uh, you can see that high there was 78, and then we got all the way up to 78.45. So what did we say this high was? 78.33. So that is a higher high, but notice MACD didn't make a higher high, RSI did not make a higher high, and even Willie did not make a higher high. So, divergence on this move up top here. That's okay. I mean, what I didn't want to see was this move here, and then this move up here, and the indicators all making divs, but I don't see that. Right, this pushed up, this pushed up, this pushed up, and most importantly, volume. Somebody stepped up and did some serious buying through this. I was pretty darn impressed when I saw that yesterday. I was like, wow, you don't see that every day. To me, what this says is, and you know, I was just one guy, I mean, fuck, like I know anything, but this says to me. That is now a very serious floor in this asset. I suppose you could argue that until we do break this high that was put in yesterday, this is nothing more than a trading range for the time being. But 
The fact that the market did come down here and then violently reverse and push up and smash through these old highs, that tells me there is a hell of a lot of buying interest. Somebody down here has got a major hard on for this thing. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like uh, Benkoff checks, right? So this thing was moving higher. It dipped back down into this original sort of bullish zone. And whoever it was that pushed this thing up and broke it out said, hey, this thing's on spe special. Awesome. Let's go get some more. And if I'm not mistaken, I think even Sjord, he... When this thing was dumping and the whole fucking market was just melting down, Seward was in there buying more. <laughs> Way to go, Seward. I swear, Seward's got a... Uh, uh, I got it. It's almost beautiful watching. So, I, and I was pretty, I was like, I was just watching him. I was like, hey, don't lose your cool. I mean, this thing's got definitely, it's got a head of steam behind it. This is not a bear market. So is this the top? Maybe, but you know, might as well at least let it see a top out before we call tops. I don't think it's anywhere near a top. And the fact that it did reverse halfway through yesterday was insanely bullish. So somebody really likes this thing. And like what I would say, you know, we often say wicks and tails like to be eaten. I would argue that this now is a massive sort of demand zone. Now, we'll see. This won't confirm until we actually break out through that high there. Right now, we have a big supply zone and a big demand zone. And basically, all this is right now is a big uh, diamond pattern. But if we can tick up through that high and, you know, crypto settles down and we get beyond this weekend and that ticks up through that high, this this is probably now a historic sort of uh, when the market crashes some point in the future, right, it's going zipping up here, it will come down and this will actually be the window that stops the bear in the future. So that's super cool. But we'll see. We really want to see this high taken out first. That would be the icing on the cake to tell me that, yep, that's that's for legit. So, anyway, so it's interesting to see that, that, that this guy was about the only cryptocurrency I saw that was actually able to buck the overall trend. So, and uh, you're asking specifically about some of these little ones, and I'll say... A lot of them took some serious technical damage here with that wipeout the other day. Both the MIR and the AKT both lost their key support lows. And a lot of these coins look like they're just, you know, that that there's no, no reason to be bullish there whatsoever right now. At the very best, we're going to have to wait for divergences to start forming, right? And on your indicators, they make... <clears throat> higher lows right so there's your div and then down here we'll get our buy signal way over there so this is going to take quite a while to clean up so boo hiss hiss boo but it is what it is you know if anything um, super important that we get this across to you guys the moment this starts to get really easy and you're just in one way and everything's rocking and rolling and it's all blue skies, guess what? <laughs> That's just about the time when you should start to expect things to fall apart. As soon as the guys come along and say, eh, technical analysis isn't really that relevant. Eh, you don't have to worry about divergences. Eh, M's in price don't matter. Well, <laughs> I think you guys know how the rest of that goes. Uh, okay, so ba 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 do 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 do. Often I see you talking about guys. Okay, so I just said some. Okay, yep. Okay, we did that. Oh yeah. Ah, Jesus. What is the meaning behind you liquidate me, I liquidate myself? Uh, well, uh, OK Coin. I don't even know, man. I used to, uh, I used to pretty much just chart Bitcoin off of OK Coin forwards. That's all I did. Um, but uh, you can see. Um, 
Bitcoin itself traded across a whole bunch of different exchanges. And a while ago, there were a few um, uh, specific uh, exchanges, and we used to trade the uh, three month forwards. Like if I go, uh, <sighs> I can't even remember how you do these things now. Something like that. Oh, isn't that funny? Anyway, um, we used to have uh, these forward contracts on OKCoin. Okay it used to be primarily, yeah, there we go. So, oh, these are futures. Yeah, interesting. So they call these things futures, but they trade on Binance. I don't think that's a futures exchange. So it's kind of a, it's weird how, because this is an unregulated space, they can even get away with call, mislabeling these things for years. And nobody seems to give a shit. Oh, well, well go figure. There you go. So OKCoin, okay BTC, uh, there's the perp on OKCoin. Okay so as I said, uh, OKCoin okay used to have uh, futures contracts or forwards. Uh, that's these things when I uh, tell you about these spreads. <clears throat> so there it is, BTC 31, 17, 20, 21. I think that's, uh, that's the OKCoin okay contract. So because these uh, forward contracts are constantly, um, how did I do that? <laughs> That's so bizarre. BTC, oh, I got to do like the whole date. Is that what I have to do? 31, Z2021, like that. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. So because these contracts have an expiry, Technically, they can push these things around all over the place. And in fact, uh, you see that actually these things relative to the spot markets, these forwards contracts can trade at massive premiums and also massive discounts. And remember, a lot of these people buy these forwards contracts on margin. You know, they'll put like 10% down, 20% down. So... Uh, if you put 10% down, oh, big stretch. Uh, and, the, and the contract is, um, yeah, here we are. If you put 10% down and the contract's $48,000, at what price does this have to go to where you have your 10% that you put down as collateral is gone? There, it's disappeared. There is no more collateral. Answer is 10% movement in the price of the asset, right? So what are the, what's the statistical odds? There's the Bitcoin forwards contract. What's the statistical odds that that thing moves, uh, what, $4,800 in the next, I don't know, month? I'd say probably pretty good. Where's my baseball hat? Where's my baseball hat? Oh, well. Gonna have to hold on to the D-Gen look <laughs> while I'm done here today. Um, so, you know, could they push this price here 10% to force a margin liquidation of somebody? The answer, absolutely. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Uh, and that's basically what they did was uh, there was a particular Bitcoin crash. The OK coin forwards moved quite a bit extra than the spot market. The person who was on the exchange had a very large margin position on um they called it sort of an anomaly that happened on like uh, somebody basically went after the stop loss orders on OK coin and it just triggered a cascade of price movement the price moved like you know typical bitcoin 30 40% in like a heartbeat and a guy got margin liquidated because his 10% capital that he put down to control the futures contract 
it was gone. And when that 10% capital is gone, the exchange automatically liquidates the position because they're not going to take any risk on the other 90% that they, uh, that they lent him. So it just goes to show it's super, super, super dangerous to buy on margin. Um, through that particular event, and I'd have to get the date, like if you could find the date, we could actually go through the price action. But if I remember correctly, it was an anomaly. It was just something zing, zing. Price went zipping down and then zipping back up. And um, they basically it was a non-event. Other than the fact that this guy who had, I think it was about a $10 million position, he got liquidated on the big price swing. And he was not happy about that one bit. Of course, you know, this is half the reason why we want regulated exchanges. They have things like daily position move limits. So something like this can't happen just out of the blue. Because you're not supposed to have a market that's like, you know, 10% margin be able to move more than 10% in one day because in one day you can flush out all those people that are playing uh, the, the the margin game. So at the in typical historical legacy futures markets, they'll have like a 2% loss limit. And if the market moves 2%, then trading is just stopped so that that kind of event can't happen. Uh, so somebody saying uh, there was a bad uh, run on Bybit as well. Eh? <clears throat> so uh, make no mistake about it. These unregulated exchanges, they're just like the Forex. Remember I was telling you about the Forex? How they can fill your stop loss orders even though price never trades at those levels? It's the same thing. And it's why I, I, I constantly tell people that you know a little bit of regulation isn't such a bad thing in this world <clears throat> the easy way to, of course to avoid all of this is just don't trade on margin right you trade on margin you're potentially putting yourself into that kind of trouble or if you're going to trade lever do something like buy a call option or buy a put option that can be a leverage instrument but the swing in the price of the asset doesn't affect you, you know, for margin purposes. I don't even mind, to be honest with you. There's, there are people in the crypto space that play like Phoenix, which is three times margin. That's not bad. But it's something like, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, like they got these 100x margin uh, leverage places. That's just degenerate gambling, and you're going to get wiped out. <laughs> it takes 1% move against you to wipe you out. That's just, you're just wasting your time. That's not being professional. So anyway, I hope that helps answer the question. It's, it's, a, it's a deep, deep, deep question. Why did, why did it happen? Uh, it happened because of the unregulated nature of this space, guys. Simple as that. Okay, guys, uh, I do have to go get pretty for the boy here. Um, hope you all enjoyed that rant. I hope I lived up to the uh, to the expectations of my fan base. <laughs> um, always striving to try and give you guys value. So I hope you guys felt like you got some value out of that. And, you know, maybe uh, one or two things you can add to your notes. I always think it's a good idea when you watch these broiler chicken shows to have like a little journal beside you. Just what did I learn? What did I see? How do I feel? I tell you, those three things, nothing ever changes. I even heard people in the class today. And, uh, you know, really, guys, it comes down to that every single day. What did I see? What did I learn? How do I feel? Right? Just log those three things every single day. And then the biggest thing is you just got to show up. Right? And then anybody who's sort of like, I want to be a day trader, get into the battle stations room. Uh, if it means that you've got to get through level two, just to make sure that uh, we, you understand the nomenclature, because keep in mind, level two is just solid nomenclature, nomenclature, nomenclature. 
you got to be able to talk the talk if you're going to hang out with the day traders. We don't want to sit there and have to teach you uh, while you're working away. So anyway, have some fun on the site. I tell you, the site itself is just, it's incredible. Uh, now that uh, Seward's got the uh, things like the dashboard up and running, I think we get a pretty clear idea of what's going on in the market. Sadly, of course, you can see crypto just took a major punch in the nose. Boo, hiss, hiss, boo. Our, our fear, greed indicators looking pretty darn uh, grim anyway. And then, of course, you know, we've, already, we've been talking about this for a while. It was a question of whether crypto could really lead us out of this. But the broader market just is not happy at all. I mean, geez, look at these things. They all look like bloody ski slopes. The only part of the market that even looks remotely happy is the bond market, which is the risk off part of the market. So suppose it shouldn't surprise us that eventually crypto got dragged down into the mud. I thought it was hilarious. This is this is adorable. So, you know, I like to have this like, well, this is the if I want to be long, these are the five names that I want to be long in crypto right now. One's a, a, a currency fiat proxy. One's Ethereum. And Sjord clearly wants us long Luna. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I mean, it, there's not a hell of a lot to get excited about in the marketplace today. So I thought it was adorable that Luna came up three times. <laughs> That's adorable. Anyway, so, you know, go slowly, everybody. We got to get through this. They always say, you know, and I've told you guys this before. Try and remember this. Don't get into the habit or don't even get into the business of predicting what's going to happen. You know, everybody and their brother was going, okay, we're going to go to the man, 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 man. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like we kind of stalled out here. How's Alan doing? God, if anybody listened to Alan, I mean, that's so frustrating. Uh... Because, you know, you just get filled with all this uh, over-the-top uh, unbounded enthusiasm, I think they call it. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Jesus, this is painful. So go slowly, everybody. Don't get sucked into uh, the euphoria. Uh, don't take too much risk on any one single trade. Sometimes you're going to have markets like this where it just literally runs into a buzzsaw. <laughs> And uh, your best bet is to make damn sure that you can come back and play the game again tomorrow. And it might just be like something like this. It might just be you just got to sit on your hands and let everything just settle on. Because as it stands right now, this would if you're going to go in and buy something that looks like this, maybe we have okay location. But to me, that looks like you're coming in and catching a falling knife. So go slowly here, folks. Please go very slowly. If anything, for all the people that took our education program this past uh, quarter, hopefully you had a really, really good lesson in why you got to go slowly in this stuff. Because uh, this market, it, it's got, you can imagine just even kids like a week or two ago came into these thinking, hey, I'm going to get stinking rich. And they just got bitch slapped here. There's a lot of this going on right now. Okay, guys, go slowly. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Hopefully next uh, Wednesday's uh, Crypto Top 100 Review show, we'll, uh, we'll have a whole bunch of Ws to get excited about. I suppose the good part about it is a lot of these kind of markets, they're finally bringing price back down into buying windows so we can start hunting for Ws again. So that's a good sign. But as it stands right now, I think uh, probably the best thing for me to do is try and stop talking. Go get pretty for the boy. Ask everybody for big good lucks and best wishes um, with Liam. Um, and my number one job for the rest of today is to make sure this little special needs guy feels as though he's the most important person in this entire universe. So that's what I'm going to go do. All right, everybody. Every says great day. PMA for the win. All the best. And bye for now.